Catholics, both um, historic um, uh, Protestant and historic black churches, uh, or over a million Floridians who um, find it um, incredibly important in their personal lives, in their family lives, in their community, to follow in the steps of Jesus, to seek excellence in community and in home life, and um, to practice the golden rule, uh, to do unto others as we want them to do unto us. And we believe that these are the fundamental principles of what life together is all about. And they've been missing in our statewide politics for a long time. Too many siren calls for extreme positions have been taken. And we want to issue a call to the legislature as it begins its session on March 2nd to uh, find the golden mean, find the sweet spot between the extremes, to, to seek virtuous policy that allows everybody to thrive, uh, not just um, to self-indulge us because we have the freedom and the power to do whatever we can do, but actually move to that place where our neighbors are served because scripture calls us to use our freedom to help others not simply to fatten our own checkbooks or um, fatten our own livers as it will so uh, with us today are an esteemed set of uh, faith leaders who are active in various ways in what we consider five critical areas of concern. And we're gonna begin uh, first with hearing from a lay missionary in the Miami area, uh, Angel uh, Pittman, who's the communication specialist for Pastors for Florida Children, um, an organization devoted to um, spending public dollars for high quality public education for every child in the state of Florida. Angel. Thank you. Florida lawmakers are considering an unprecedented expansion of the state's private school voucher program. I'm a former classroom teacher and I'm an education advocate for the Cooperative Baptist Fellowship. I exclusively serve low-income families in Miami-Dade County and I've witnessed firsthand how these programs work to undermine our public schools by diverting more public funding to private schools with no accountability or protections for students. Senate Bill 48 would merge Florida's numerous existing private school scholarship programs into two education savings account vouchers. It would vastly expand the ways these public funds can be used on private education making it vulnerable to fraud, abuse, seen in similar education savings account programs. The proposed legislation also foolishly decreases the frequency of already inadequate audits under these programs from annually to an astounding three years. Meanwhile, public funding for these vouchers would increase year after year and come directly from an ever-decreasing education budget which dropped 30% from 2008 to 2018. Private schools participating in Florida's voucher programs are not held to the same standards, nor do they provide the same student services to students as public schools, and our students are suffering. Students attending private voucher schools lose critical protections that public schools must uphold including providing special education stu services to students with disabilities. I have personally seen private schools promise special education services, but instead six weeks into the school year, move students to subpar support for students with disabilities by untrained teachers with inadequate content mastery and untested methods. The parents only recourse was to remove the child from the school. The results are students who not only fail to make academic progress, but also suffer dangerous disability regressions. Our faith compels us to protect the most vulnerable students, and parents backed into these situations, like these mid-year changes, 
are not uncommon, and many don't learn of the rights that they forfeited in taking a private school scholarship until it's too late, and children ultimately return to their local public school. In fact, a U.S. Government Accountability Office report found that voucher programs, including Florida's, often do not inform families about losing their rights to protect students with disabilities in, as they do in public schools. Parents also unknowingly pay high costs for forfeiting services in their choice of a private school. Take, for example, a family I worked with. Their two children attended a small private school in Homestead, Florida, using a step-up scholarship, but they had to pay for transportation out of their own pockets. A work-related illness in the fall of 2019, coupled with COVID-19 sh shutdowns, forced the family into even deeper financial hardship, and they racked up a $2,000 transportation debt that ultimately forced the children out of the school. With the school refusing to release the children's transcripts without payments, the students missed months of learning. Vouchers voucher schools discriminate and they can deny students enrollment based on family characteristics such as students' religion or fluency in English. Such practices ensure that voucher schools continue the segregationist traditions in which they were founded, making schools more racially and economically segregated than ever. Florida public schools exist to all, serve all children and we believe that children are a blessing from the Lord. State lawmakers must reject policies like Senate Bill 48 that seek to destroy this. Thank you very much, Angel, uh, for helping us understand uh, the difficulties uh, be behind um, the tax credit scholarships and why they really hurt families in the long run rather than helping them. Our next speaker, is uh, Senior Bishop of the African Methodist Episcopal Church um, uh, and Bishop of the 11th Episcopal District, which includes Florida and the Bahamas. Um, and we welcome uh, uh, Bishop uh, Adams Jefferson uh, Richardson. Bishop Richardson, good to have you with us today. Thank you very much and honored to be here and uh, to join this uh, esteemed panel for this very much needed um, conversation. There is a particular hymn that Methodists tend to sing at the end of our annual conferences. One of the verses includes these words, as pastors are dispatched to their ministry assignments for the year, go heal the sick. We take this exhortation not only to mean an earnest prayer prayed, but attention to the overall health and health care of the communities where we live and work and study and worship by every means available. These concerns not only become ministries of the church as well as other faith communities and traditions, but also a call for the use of our influence by voice and vote to the good of the whole where such influence might also consider public policies related to health. And this is where science and faith and goodwill converge. This is where the legitimate collaboration of church and state is permissible. This is the point of inflection where advocacy for healthy communities and where attention is drawn to disparities are revealed. This of course includes environmental impact of social inequity that often lead to disease and health disparities. Matters that arise from the zip codes where we live, where we attend school, where we gather for recreation and where we worship. It seeks to ask the relevant question, why are some communities more sick and die sooner than others? Thus, health and health care are also related to environmental justice. Social inequalities become determinants of health and the quality of health care, depending on where you live. 
COVID-19, for example, has abbreviated the life expectancy of African-Americans by 2.7 years and 1.9 years for all Hispanic populations. Does the legislature care? Does the governor care? Is it in the state budget? Or is it that some citizens are deemed expendable? What then of the golden rule? It is the reason the faith community has stepped up across Florida to make their facilities available for the distribution of the vaccine to mitigate the spread of COVID-19, as we are aware that infections, morbidity, and deaths are disproportionately represented in black and brown populations. It is the reason that faith leaders are encouraging their members and members of the communities where their edifices are located to roll up their sleeves, to overcome whatever reticence they may have to take the vaccine for their own well-being and that of their families, their city, their county, and of course, our state. We charge them to get vaccinated when it comes their turn. As a state, we cannot get near a semblance of normalcy until we tackle this bully of a virus who is mean and indiscriminate. There are vulnerable populations. The fact is, we all are vulnerable. No one is exempt. The virus is not a hoax. People are dying. And who would know better than those who preside over funerals? More than 2.5 million people have died globally. 503,000 people have died nationwide and 31,000 at least have died who called themselves Floridians. The Florida legislature therefore ought to care and care enough to avoid extreme positions, care enough to make a plan. It is the duty of all of us to do our part, as the hymn says, to heal the sick, to create the environment where the health of our state is at its optimal best. And this includes at a minimum, not only the equitable distribution of the vaccine, but the mandated wearing of face masks, being physically distanced, keeping our gatherings small and washing our hands frequently until we have defeated our common enemy, COVID-19. Go heal the sick. Amen. Thank you very much, Bishop Richardson. Uh, alarming numbers uh, of the real impact in uh, real time. And we need real solutions in real time from the Florida legislature. Our next speaker is Reverend Dr. Uh, uh, James uh, uh, Morris, uh, pastor at Carter Tabernacle um, CME Church in Orlando and presiding elder for the CME Church in the Orlando area. Uh, Dr. Morris, good to have you with us. Uh, you've also served as a state legislator in Missouri, so you understand this process very well, both the necessity of the golden mean in politics and the golden rule in how we conduct ourselves. Yes. Thank you, uh, Dr. Meyer. Uh, good to be with you and my esteemed colleagues on this panel. I want to talk uh, this morning about the uh, value, or should I say valuing, uh, the dignity of employment, which seems to be uh, something that is missing uh, in the state of Florida, particularly in the conversations um, that uh, come out of Tallahassee. Uh, Defending the dignity of employment and work seems to be a constant uphill struggle. And that's because the prevailing economic thinking um, that's moving the industry uh, seems to be that uh, uh, work um, as a cost of production 
uh, is more important than those who actually do the work. That is to say that um, there seems to be, particularly coming out of Tallahassee, this idea uh, that um, the cost must be kept as low as possible uh, in order to um, affect a good bottom line figure. Uh, we know that that has been a part of the thinking of the global economy uh, for many years. Um, nowhere in sight um, is the societal significance of work as a foundation uh, of personal dignity, uh, as a source of stability and uh, the development of families uh, or, or as a contribution to communities at peace. Uh, many of our communities are uh, resemble war zones and um, violence uh, runs rampant. And that's directly tied to the lack of employment, gainful employment uh, by citizens uh, of Florida. I find it uh, particularly appalling that there is a move afoot in the legislature now uh, to scale back um, the idea of a $15 minimum wage, which Floridians overwhelmingly voted to support. Uh, this type of movement, the, these, these attitudes toward uh, workers is appalling. Uh, and we must uh, stand uh, opposed to uh, this kind of thinking. Uh, we know that the quality of work defines in so many ways the quality of our society. The two are inextricably tied together. And until we operate as though we understand that, uh, cities and communities across Florida uh, are going to be always in turmoil. Uh, our policies should be about keeping people moving into progressively better jobs, uh, jobs with living wages. Uh, we ought to have respect for workers' rights, uh, non-discrimination and gender equality. All of these aspects of, of, of employment um, adversely affect our society. And so uh, we stand um, to say to our legislature that you've got to begin to see the correlation between employment and quality of life, not just in certain areas, but across the entire uh, state of Florida. As a person of faith, I would always remind our legislatures that scripture is replete with passages about workers and the dignity and the right and respect that must be paid to our workers. I would like to direct all of your attention, all of our attention to Ecclesiastes chapter three, uh, beginning with the ninth verse, reading from the New Living Translation. What do people really get for all their hard work? I have thought about this in connection with the various kinds of work God has given people to do. God has made everything beautiful for its own time. He has planted eternity in the human heart. But even so, people cannot see the whole scope of God's work from the beginning to end. So I conclude, the writer says, that there is nothing better for people than to be happy and to enjoy themselves as long as they can. And people should eat and drink and enjoy the fruits of their labor, for these are gifts from God. And I remind our legislature that valuing the dignity of work and employment are in line with gifts from God. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Morris. Uh, uh, appreciate that uh, great um, um, uh, statement on the dignity of work. And our, our workers uh, who have lost their job need compensation. We, we have one of the worst unemployment compensation programs in the country. Um, women 
give birth and, and within a week have to go back to work. Um, and so we have to dignify the worker and not just protect uh, false prophets. Uh, we uh, move on to hear from uh, Reverend Dr. Raymond Johnson, who is uh, both the president of the Florida Council of Churches Board and coordinator of the Cooperative Baptist Fellowship in Florida. Uh, Dr. Johnson. Thank you, Dr. Meyer, and good morning, everyone. I am Ray Johnson, the, the coordinator of Florida's Cooperative Baptist Fellowship. For those who may not know, we are a branch of the Baptist tradition that seeks to live into its name. That is, we try to be cooperative. Uh, being Baptist, however, means that we live in this constant state of tension, for the force in us to be independent is strong. Uh, so strong, in fact, that I am compelled to declare at the outset that I speak for myself as a Baptist, but not for Baptists, even cooperative ones. We Baptists have historically thought of ourselves as grassroots Christians. In our spiritual practices, we emphasize the freedom and the responsibility of the individual person to practice her or his own faith. In our church life, we eschewed denominational hierarchies and insisted upon the freedom of a local Baptist church to govern itself. We believe that a free person in a free church is, with the guidance of Scripture and God's Spirit, the surest path to an authentic, abundant, and enriching life in Christ. The Apostle Paul stated in his letter to the Galatians that it was for freedom that Christ set us free. Likewise, the very first phrase of Florida's state constitution declares that we, the people of the state of Florida, Florida, being grateful to Almighty God for our constitutional liberty, it's founded in gratitude for liberty. It is for these reasons, especially, that I find myself instinctively recoiling at the mounting legislative assaults on local grassroots governance and determination, on what has been called home rule, particularly when it comes to laws that have direct impact upon Florida's natural resources and scenic beauty, the protection of which is enshrined in our state's constitution. These preemptive statutes strip away a local community's ability to deal with the effects of climate upon their local environment, effects that they can see for themselves, smell for themselves, hear for themselves. We all know, I suspect, that Florida's waters are under extreme stress from global warming and from the extractive practices of mega corporations, many of which are not even based in Florida. Just yesterday, for example, news was released that Nestle's has been granted a permit for the price of $115 to mine 1 million gallons of water per year from Jenny Springs. Right now, there are bills currently under consideration by the 2021 Florida legislature, all of which seek to remove local control from matters related to energy production, which as we know has direct and significant impact upon Florida's fragile ecosystems. Here are just a few of these preemption bills. Senate Bill 856 and HB 839 seek to take away local communities' authority over all energy infrastructure, including oil wells, solar panels, even gas stations. And in my opinion, worse, they seek to nullify existing laws that promote commitments to renewable energy sources at the local level. SB 1008, HB 761, allow electrical utilities to build solar farms in any rural agricultural area without local consent. Senate Bill 1128 and HB 919 mandate that local governments cannot decide how buildings in their own communities are to be powered. The bill essentially forces local communities to accept the death hold of fossil fuels upon them. Florida's constitution says that it shall be the policy of the state to conserve and protect its natural resources and scenic beauty. Our legislators are being wooed by powerful interests in narrow ideological politics to preempt, to circumvent, to nullify local grassroots government at the expense of every single individual who calls the Sunshine State home. As a result, our representatives are losing sight of the constitutional policy to conserve 
and protect our state's magnificent resources and beauty. I remember a time just a few years ago when we could start walking on the beaches of Pensacola and walk the entire shoreline of the Florida Peninsula unencumbered by nothing but estuaries and inlets because the beaches of Florida belong to all the people of Florida, not to a few multimillionaires who, to paraphrase the prophet Amos, panted after the sand on the feet of Floridians. That freedom is gone now because a couple of years ago, money and political influence won the battle for the heart of our representatives. They lost sight of their own homes and their constituents. It's time for our representatives to legislate out of gratitude for the liberty, the freedom that is constitutionally guaranteed to every one of us and to our local communities. Thank you very much, Dr. Johnson. We deeply appreciate uh, hearing your words and uh, your call to uh, how best to use our freedom. Uh, as a, a final presentation, uh, I'd like to speak to our democracy here in Florida. I am again, the Reverend Dr. Russell Meyer, Executive Director of the Florida Council of Churches, and I serve as uh, the pastor at St. John's Lutheran Church in Jacksonville. Uh, Florida, along with Texas and California, now have a pluralistic democracy. What do we mean when we say pluralistic democracy? What we mean is no one demographic can win statewide office simply on its own. The days when uh, uh, white politicians, and if we're in the South, we're talking about white supremacist politicians for the most of our history, could simply rely upon white voters to win office, those days are gone. In this last election in November 2020, um, the uh, Republican Party had significant gains in the state of Florida. Congratulations to them. But please take note, they did that by uh, wooing a significant number of Latino votes who had not participated in previous elections. That is to say the current regime did not get elected simply on the white vote. Even if the impact of their policies continue to serve white supremacy in the state. Moving forward, Florida is the leader in what pluralistic democracy is all about. Our public policy has to be able to service all of the various cultures and ethnic groups in this state. No one ethnic group can win on its own going forward. In the last election, national election cycle, Florida's population outgrew that of the rest of the nation by almost two to one. We are continuing to grow in population in this state, and that growth is in diversity. We are a pluralistic state, and we need public policies that support a healthy pluralism in which all peoples can flourish. Before the legislature today uh, are a number of policies that would shut down that pluralistic voice. Uh, many, many uh, people across um, Florida are uh, deeply concerned about HB1, um, which is an anti-liberty bill, a, a bill that would restrict the ability of folks to gather in public uh, to either present their concerns in protest or to conduct prayer vigils. It would simply uh, make everybody in that gathering criminally liable if the Proud Boys or the Oath Keepers uh, or Antifa, as some fear, uh, would just start a melee in that group. Suddenly, that gathering would all be a felony. It's just hard to imagine um, holding a prayer vigil 
in public and somebody who doesn't like our prayers starting a ruckus so that we all can be arrested and felonized uh, by it. But that's exactly what the governor has proposed and the House is taking up. Along um, similar lines are a number of bills that would restrict mail-in voting and would increase the difficulty for the most vulnerable populations in our state to get to the polls. This is moving in the wrong direction. We need a Florida that helps everybody participate in the political process. As a pastor, I know that when I work with a congregation, uh, if I decide only certain people can speak at the congregation meeting and other people have to sit down and be quiet, that's the surest way to create a riot in my church. There has to be a place for everybody to legitimately be able to voice their opinion. Pluralistic health, the health of our democracy in Florida means that Everybody has to have the right to speak what's on their mind in ways that are fitting in, uh, publicly and that they can cast their vote unimpeded. We need to be doing more to enhance our civic participation, not restrict it. It is an extreme position that says we're going to make certain certain people can't vote. To that re, uh, degree, every returning citizen needs to be empowered to join civic society. We know that people commit less crime, less offense against society if they have a path to full participation. So the greatest way to increase our public safety is to increase participation in society. And so we strongly uh, object to uh, HB1 and to the other bills that would restrict voting and would increase felonies. Right now, the state of Florida is the only state that does not have any form of parole. I want you to hear that again. We are the only state that has no form of parole. We need to be helping people recover what it means to participate civically, not keeping them punished forever. That's an extreme position. The future of Florida is a Florida in which all can participate. And we should be about policies that make that happen. We thank you for your uh, time and your consideration and your attention to this set of five issues around education, healthcare, employment, uh, home rule, and civic participation. We believe these are five critical areas of concern where we need to uh, strive for excellence and practice the golden rule. Uh, we end with uh, this one uh, particularly poignant scripture um, from Galatians. Um, the apostle says, you are called to freedom, brothers and sisters. Only don't let this freedom be an opportunity to indulge your selfish impulses, but serve each other through love. All the law has been fulfilled in a single statement. Love your neighbor as yourself. And Florida needs laws that reflect that very teaching that is common to every world religion. Our, our concern is, is, to, uh, is to make uh, Florida aware of the spiritual center of our life together. Whether, wh whether one is affiliated with a religion or not, is a, is a practicing believer or not, we all have spirit. We all have breath, right? Uh, in, in, in religious literature, spirit and breath, that's the, that's the same word, right? There, there's something that animates us together as individuals 
and as families, as communities, as society. And, and it's that power that animates our life that we ought to have uh, central in the work that we do together. We name that as the spirit of God. Uh, whether others are able to do that is, is not what we're trying to force upon anyone, but we are trying to lift up. It's the animating breath of life that we all share that ought to be at the center of our concern in our political life. It's been missing, and it's our role as faith leaders to lift it up. Thank you, sir. Thank you. God bless you all. Thank you very much for giving me uh, your time and your attention today. And let's uh, put the word out. All right. Thank you.